Kurt Lischke was in charge of annihilating a people. It was a death factory, basically. You know, it was a death factory. There was no will to bring uh, the Nazi criminals to justice. The Klarsfelds believe in action. We had to do something. There were plots in Germany to kill us. Nothing, nothing, nothing would stop them. Cologne, West Germany. Political activists Serge and Bieta Klarsfeld stake out an apartment building in a quiet neighborhood. It is home to Nazi war criminal Kurt Lischke. It is 100% Lischke's job to organize the arrests, deportation, and the ferrying of the Jews east which, of course, is that great Nazi euphemism for exterminating people in camps such as Auschwitz. A legal loophole protects Nazis like Lischke from prosecution in Germany. The Klarsfelds are on a mission to change the law and make Lischke pay for his crimes. We had learned that most of the Nazi criminals who had been active in the deportation of the Jews of France had remained in Germany under their own names. We were very outraged by the fact that they became uh, uh, judges, uh, businessmen, high officials. They wanted to force the Germans to see that they had in their midst a major Nazi criminal. The husband and wife team have traveled from their home in Paris to track down the war criminal. Beata called uh, information in Cologne and had no problem immediately getting an address for Kurt Lischke. Kurt Lischke, uh, this is his number and uh, his address, Bergisch Gladbacher Straße. You know, it was as easy as this. For Serge, this isn't just about politics. A French Jew, he lost family in the Holocaust. We saw him leaving to go to work as an accountant. He was a businessman. But 30 years ago, Lischke had a very different job. As Gestapo chief in Paris, he orchestrated the murder of 33,000 Jews. He sent out to Paris, where he heads up the the Jewish Affairs Department. And that doesn't mean looking after Jews. That means effectively killing them. He organized the arrest of Jews in France uh, and their deportation to Auschwitz. And that's his job. He's in charge of annihilating a people. After the war, he fell in the hands of uh, the Czech authorities. They released him in 1950. He went back to live in Germany, and he lived quietly with his family and tried to get on with a normal life. He was a prosperous German businessman. It's extraordinary to think that someone could have gone from exterminating people to living this sort of upper-middle-class life, but that was the way it was. In recent years, Lischke has prospered. He is now a finance executive for a grain shipping company in Cologne. He was sending uh, grains uh, exactly like Jews. He was uh, sending grains. Uh, it's the same work as sending Jews. The next morning, the Klarsfelds are back on Lischke Street. This time, they've hired a cameraman to try to capture the Nazi on film. The Klarsfelds found out where he would walk on his way to the streetcar. He had to take the streetcar to get to work in Cologne. Lischke is not scuttling under rocks. Lischke is living very openly. 
und sind äh, an einer Ecke ein bisschen andere Kante gegangen. And suddenly we saw a tall man. He was wearing a black coat, carrying a briefcase and was smoking a cigarette. Serge said, "Yes, that's him." Zigarette rauchend. Und Glasfeld sagte, "Ja, das ist er." It is the start of a dramatic cat and mouse chase that will last almost nine years. We filmed Lischka when he went out from his uh, apartment. I started shooting him from one angle to keep him in the frame as long as possible. I was following him, walking right beside him. started to run. So I started running too. I kept one eye on the street. My right eye was on the viewfinder, trying to focus on him. We didn't want to do something against him, but he believes that perhaps we will. He hid his face behind his briefcase. And you can see on the tape that he glanced at me. Well, they certainly became his worst nightmare when in the famous footage you see the great head of the Gestapo of Paris running like a squirrel being chased by a dog. It was clear to me that this man was a criminal. You could tell by the way he acted. He was fearful of the truth that they brought. It was the truth that was pursuing him, not the Klarsfelds. It was the truth of his crimes. We shot until he got onto the streetcar. And so we had a very good material of uh, Nazi criminals running in the street uh, in Cologne. The Klarsfelds hope their film of Lischke will help sway German public opinion. Hunting down Nazi war criminals has become their life's work. He was this very intelligent, intense young lawyer, and she was an au pair, but she had a very good brain. Serge sort of opened up Beata's eyes to what had happened during the war. Beata came to see that as a German, it was her destiny with Serge to force Germany to look at its past. And their life since then has just been one long, very, very hardly fought campaign against injustice. In Germany especially, the couple face enormous obstacles. During this time, the German state networks and uh, legal apparatuses are still riddled with people who are not that interested in hunting Nazis, either because they themselves have something about their own past to hide or they know someone. In fact, Kurt Lischke has already been convicted of war crimes, not in Germany, but in France in 1950. Remarkably, as long as he stays in Germany, he's safe. People like Lischke were allowed to remain free because there was no framework agreed between the French and Germans on how to get some of these criminals into France to be tried. The Klarsfelds want to shame Germany into adopting a new law, one that will punish war criminals like Lischke. They released their film to the media. Which uh, uh, were shown in many TV uh, all over the Germany and uh, Western world. But the public outrage they're hoping for never comes. Nothing happened, there was silence. And I said, you know, uh, you have to react. Frustrated with government inertia, the Klarsfelds decide on a more radical move. The Klarsfelds, in their typical fashion, decide that. There's only one thing to do with Lischke, and that's not to write letters to members of parliament or, or lawyers, is to take direct action. These are children of the 60s after all, and they like to stage a happening. 
we decided that we will try to kidnap him in order to bring him back to France. They're going to take him back to France and they're going to present him to the French authorities and go, right, there, do something about it. The idea that they would try to kidnap an ex-Gestapo chief, it was mind-blowing. It really was. But to carry out their audacious plan, they need help. Eli is a photographer whose mother died in Auschwitz. Marco is a friend from university. And David is a doctor whose judo skills may prove useful. And we told them, are you ready to come with us? And we explained the case. And they say yes. None of them were prepared emotionally or physically. And I think it was only Serge's very strong, persuasive personality that got them on board in the first place. Beata briefs the recruits on Lishka's daily routine. She has spent days in Cologne spying on him. He left in the morning to go to his business and then coming back at noon for lunch at home and going back to his office. But we understood that it will not be easy. We knew if we will succeed, we will bring him uh, in front of the Ministry of Police in Paris. If we do not succeed, uh, it will be a case which will mobilize uh, public opinion in Germany. The team travels to Cologne. They rehearse the abduction and finalize last minute details. But the plan hits a snag when the rental car they booked isn't available. They want to rent a car. They've been promised they'll get a certain type, which has four doors. And when they arrive, the car has only got two doors. A two-door car is the worst type of car you can imagine trying to bundle someone into, especially someone very tall like Lishka. You can't just shove them in. It's the first sign of trouble. The day of the kidnap, the team moves into position. Yeah, I was, you know, a volunteer in the Israeli army in 67, uh, so uh, I was not afraid by uh, the action. The idea was once they had stuffed Lishka into the trunk, they would drive out to the outskirts of Cologne and transfer him to another rented car so that they couldn't be spotted or identified along the way back to France. understood that it was now the moment to get to go after him you know they had the plan what they didn't have were the personnel who could really carry it out. Somebody really to thwonk Lishka hard on the head. They're not exactly professional kidnappers. At the critical moment, Eli loses his nerve and freezes. I don't think they wanted to go back to France saying, uh, we just, we didn't have the courage to carry out our plan. So having failed once, maybe that bolstered their courage. In a nearby cafe, Serge rallies his troops. 
he reminds them why they're here. Kurt Lischke and hundreds of Nazis like him must face justice. The situation was the same situation for all the Nazi criminals who uh, acted in France. And uh, we wanted to change uh, that uh, situation. For Serge, in the back of his mind were the, the screams and the moans of children who first were subjected to terrible arrest. Then to an inhuman trip to Auschwitz. And finally, to the gas chamber. And Lishka, more than anyone else, was central to that happening in France. In May 1942, Lishka decreed that all Jews over the age of six wear the yellow star of David. Two months later, he ordered the largest mass arrest in French history. Thousands of Jews were arrested uh, during the great roundup of the Vélodrome d'Hiver uh, on July 16, 1942. 13,000 Jews, among them 4,000 children. More than half of the victims rounded up that day died at Auschwitz. If it wouldn't be for the fact that we were not arrested on that day, I would never have seen my 13th birthday. Simon Jerukum was only saved through the quick action of his father and mother. She took it upon herself to walk to uh, our cleaning woman who lived in the neighborhood, not very far, and she begged her to have, if we could just stay overnight in her house. I remember that moment because I was looking at my mother and I still feel to this day, I remember I felt embarrassed and my mother was crying in front of a stranger. And all we were told, you're going to be placed with farmers. They will not know you're Jewish. You'll have to pretend you're Catholic. I left the house and that's the last time I saw them. That was the very last time. I feel uh, that uh, part of myself was in a way arrested. And uh, I share the fate of uh, all those who were arrested and disappeared. Serge is determined to make the Nazi murderer pay a price. At 12.45 p.m., he leads a second kidnap attempt. So they go up to Lishka, and uh, in the street, this very tall guy. We uh, came close to him. One took uh, one hand, uh, one arm, another one took a second arm. And he's shocked, I mean, as you would be if just some random bloke came and jumped out at you. And he was very heavy, and it was very d difficult to push him. And he started to, to shout, Hilfe, Hilfe, uh, help, help. Hits him again, and Lishka sort of collapses to the ground. Not unconscious at all, but just, you know, a little bit dazed and stunned. He was uh, beating him, he went down on the ground. We were shouting. They then tried to manhandle Lishka into the car. And it's at this point that things go very badly wrong for the team. A policeman has suddenly spotted them. We ran to the car in order to escape the policeman. Liska shouting, I want my hat, I want my hat. And that's all that Liska and the policeman seem to be worried about. 
it, it's sort of a high fast almost. We uh, left for France uh, and Beata remained uh, behind uh, because she was on the other part of the street. But we knew that she could come back to by herself. I don't think they really thought they were going to cross the border into France with Lishka in the trunk of the car. But they knew they were going to cause embarrassment to the authorities. The Klarsfelds don't have their man, but they hope the bungled abduction will hit the headlines. To their disappointment, the following day, there is barely a mention. There was very few in the next day, a small uh, article uh, that uh, a man was attacked in the street. So we called the newspapers. Beata called, uh, like she, if she was a neighbor of Lishka. How is it possible that uh, nothing is uh, written uh, while uh, this poor Mr. Lishka was uh, put on the ground and uh, attacked by uh, uh, foreigners? I said, you know, these were French Jews who came to, uh, to kidnap the former police, uh, the chief of the Gestapo in France. The next day, the, it was full of uh, news because the police was obliged to say that, yes, there was an attempt of kidnapping. Beata decides to go one step further. She returns to Cologne and claims responsibility for the crime. So the police came and she presented herself as one of the kidnappers. So immediately Beate say, I organized that uh, attempt of kidnapping because Germany doesn't want to ratify the treaty between France and Germany, and Kurt Lischka was our first attempt. The police didn't want to arrest her. They understood something was happening here, which was in effect a manipulation of the police. If Germany won't put a mass murderer behind bars, then Beata will sacrifice her own freedom. March 31st, 1971. Beata Klarsfeld is back in Cologne. She wants to force the authorities to act against the former Gestapo chief of Paris. It's one thing just to say he was head of this department in Paris during the war, but you've also got to have a paper trail, and you've got to show quite what this man has done, and you've got to show bits of paper with his name and initials on and so on. Part of the uh, documents concerning the Jews uh, had remained here in France when the German retired. We had a very solid and heavy file against Lischka. As they read the documentation of the deportation period, his name was just all over every telex to Eichmann in Berlin. He was what they called the death murderer. My parents, they were actually trying to go to the non-occupied, what they call the free zone, and they were arrested on the border. And um, they were sent immediately to Auschwitz. So they were actually gassed in September. I mean, just a month and a half after we were separated. Thinking of them being so young, they were in their early 40s, you know. I didn't want to think about their suffering. This is too much for me to imagine. It was intolerable to them that criminals of that level should go on unrevenged. Justice had to be meted out to Lishka. In the company of Holocaust survivors, Beata delivers their dossier on Lishka to the prosecutor in Cologne. We met the prosecutor of the Lishka case and uh, delivered him the documents. And I said, you know, here I am. Uh, I say to you, we wanted to kidnap uh, Lishka. We could not succeed, but uh, I bring in any way his, uh, the file about him. Beata deliberately presents the prosecutor with a dilemma. If he will arrest Beata, that will make a mobilization among the victims. 
And if he will not arrest Beate, it will show that the German justice is unable to arrest people who act illegally, like the Nazi criminals. The best situation for the Klarsfelds was that Liske would continue to go about his normal life, and Beato would be thrown in jail. Now, the authorities do act. They don't arrest Liske. They arrest Beata Klarsfeld. Beata spends the next two weeks in Ossendorf prison. And every moment of that time was well worth it to the Klarsfelds because it embarrassed the official powers. This young woman is in jail, and this top Nazi is walking around. Beate and I decided to oblige the German parliament to make a law giving the possibility to judge these criminals. But Serge knows that shaming politicians may not be enough. There were powerful men, of course, uh, against uh, such a law, uh, giving the possibility to judge Nazi criminals in Germany. There was no appetite in Germany to go around soul searching by, you know, arresting people like Lischke and bringing them to trial. There was just no demand for it. The injustice of Beata's incarceration becomes a cause célèbre. All the newspapers in France uh, made uh, huge uh, articles. There are massive protests organized by Serge, you know, free Beata. Without any powers of their own other than their own courage, it's amazing to think that they found ways to use the press to affirm their moral position. The authorities cave to public pressure and release Pieta on bail. They upped the ante. They dramatized justice and injustice. But for the Klarsfelds, the harder they fight to bring Nazis to justice, the more danger they face from those determined to stop them. One day in their Paris apartment, they had um, received a parcel seemingly full of chocolates from an admirer. It was sent uh, by somebody called uh, Sigal, uh, uh, a Jewish name. But the initial of the first name and uh, the name were SS. Serge was very suspicious. So Serge opened carefully the, uh, the paper, and inside was a box of candy. And uh, in the paper, there were uh, some uh, uh, black grains. Luckily, the Beata and the children were away. A box of candy, which in fact was a bomb, had been sent to them. So I took the parcel to the police. So he put it in a plastic shopping bag and walked it down to the police station. And then one of his friends said, hey, what do you got in there, Serge? And he goes, hey, I've got a bomb. And the police examine it, and they say, uh, you are lucky to be alive. They discovered uh, 300 grams of dynamite and 500 grams of nails. This is half a kilo of high explosives that would have just torn you, the flat, completely to bits. So indeed, the class felt are very lucky. There were plots uh, by extreme rightists in Germany to kill us. They 
put their lives, their bodies on the line willingly. These are threats. Uh, we took them seriously, but we uh, never stopped. May 1973, Vieta ups the ante again. Seven months pregnant and flanked by Auschwitz survivors, she marches into Lischke's office to stage a protest. She was never frightened. She was never, ever frightened. Now confronted by his accusers, the modern business executive reveals his true Gestapo colors. He took a gun to put one of the demonstrators uh, against the wall. Did he hate the Klarsfelds? He certainly was fearful of them. He wouldn't have done this uh, without the fact that he was uh, afraid of being punished. Slowly, slowly, with our uh, demonstrative actions, uh, we put pressure on the German society. The Klaasfelds are really savvy manipulators, and they knew how to present a really good image to the public. They wanted Germany to deal with Lischke. That was our uh, uh, strategy. Serge himself was a child of the Holocaust. I believe he was eight years old when his father was taken away. It was September, 1943. The Gestapo burst into Serge's home. He, along with his sister and mother, hid in a secret compartment inside their closet. And they started to look for us, and one German opened the door of the closet, and uh, he put all uh, aside all the clothes uh, like that, but he didn't touch the, the, the wood. And in the morning, when the Germans were no more there, we escaped. The young Serge didn't know what had happened to his father. We phoned the, to the German prosecutor saying, you know, if you do nothing in order to judge the criminals, one day somebody will come uh, with an armed weapon and kill Lischka. Despite the pressure, there is still no movement among German lawmakers. In December 1973, three years after their hunt began, Serge can wait no longer. He will take the law into his own hands. Serge traveled alone with a pistol to Cologne. I knew that the, the threat of killing the Nazi criminals will not be believed until we would show it effectively. If he couldn't get justice, through the court system, he would finally have to administer justice himself. I waited uh, Lischka to go out from his office, to go to his car. Uh, when he arrived uh, to his car, I, uh, by surprise, uh, arrived with a gun. Serge took that pistol and shoved it in his face. He was shouting and uh, afraid. I uh, put the gun on his uh, head. Lushka's eyes bulged out. He immediately believed that he will be killed. Just like his victims 30 years earlier, Kurt Lishka is forced to stare death in the face. One of those victims was Serge's father, Arno Klarsfeld. Like thousands of other French Jews, he was deported on the Gestapo chief's orders. He was sent to Auschwitz. He survived until August 1944, and uh, then he died. Lischke 
was the single major figure in the murder of French Jews who was still alive and still could be punished. And if no one else was going to do it, then he would do it. I decided that uh, I did not survive for nothing. Lishka thought he was about to die. Lishka! I decided not to kill because uh, uh, that would be an act of despair. I didn't shoot. I smiled, I laughed, and I left uh, running. Uh. <laughs> Shoving a revolver between the eyes of Kurt Lischke was a symbolic murder. And this was his way of saying, we want justice, we don't want revenge. They are sent back to Paris and again, and then we talk phone to, to the German prosecutors. I told them, you see, if we want to kill these criminals, we can, even with a gun, even protected. Uh, we, and it will happen if you do not do your duty. Eventually, after much to and froing and a lot of pressure from the class belts, eventually the law is passed. We, we obtained finally the ratification. It was done in January 1975. Five years after their campaign began, the new law is enacted. It is dubbed the Klarsfeld Law in recognition of their tireless effort. But their fight is far from over. Lischke and other Nazi criminals must now be brought to judgment. We were uh, leading a war against these n Nazi criminals. They had found a way to use their own ingenuity, their own courage, their own lack of fear about what might happen to them to accomplish great things. July 1978, two years after the Klarsfeld Law was passed. German police arrest Kurt Lischke for the murder of 33,000 French Jews. I think the most important was that this man we had uh, confronted before uh, at this time never thought that one day they would be uh, 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 judged. So it became possible to have a trial in Cologne. At that time, we were very, very happy. The forthcoming trial stirs up a real hornet's nest of neo-Nazi activity against the Klaasfelds. During the night, uh, we heard an explosion, and uh, they had told me what it is. I believe it's our car. In uh, the garage at the bottom of the apartment block where the Klaasfelds live, the car is blown to pieces by a car bomb. Subsequent investigations revealed that the car bomb was intended to go off when Serge was driving his daughter to school. So this was actually an act of attempted murder. It says so much of the bravery of the class felt that that doesn't stop them. If you are obsessed with security, you, you cannot do anything. October 23rd, 1979. The Kurt Lischke trial opens. Even though Lischke had been brought to trial, the, the class fails don't end it there. I mean, they never say never. They decide that the best way to help impress upon the German public the severity of the crimes he's being tried for, they have a lot of former French concentration camp inmates turning up wearing their concentration camp uniforms with the yellow Star of David on it. Also on trial for war crimes are Lischke's deputy, Ernst Heinrichsen, 
and Herbert Hagen, a high-ranking SS leader in wartime France. They brought in the three defendants and put them in kind of a fenced-in area. And they looked like three businessmen. They had looks on their faces like, oh, why are you doing this to us, you know? What, what is this all about? We're not criminals. For the verdict, the Klarsfelds pull one last stunt. They charter a special train from France carrying 1,500 Jews. It was the trains and the cattle wagons that took the Jews eastwards from France through Germany and to, to the uh, extermination camps. This train was seen as a highly symbolic act of bringing a train of Jews, French Jews, into Germany for the trial. It was a big uh, march through the streets of Cologne. The youngsters were staying outside and shouting, Kalischka murder, uh, Hagen murder. French Jews, who had been powerless, suddenly felt, yes, we, we are a people. Nine years after the Klarsfelds first staked out Kurt Lischke's apartment, all three defendants are found guilty. I think uh, catching the, those murderers is something that uh, people like myself, is here for my generation, would feel a great deal of, uh, I would say the word joy. You know, justice had been served in some ways. Nobody would ever have identified the principles of the final solution in France if it weren't for the Klarsfelds. And Lischka was sentenced to 10 years of jail. Although Lischka was sentenced for 10 years, he in fact only serves five years, and he's released in the mid-1980s uh, on grounds of ill health, and, uh, and he dies in a nursing home. The Lischka trial was for us uh, the trial of those who lived uh, unpunished in Germany during uh, more than 30 years, and eventually were sentenced by a new Germany. With our work, we obliged them to do something what they didn't want. It's very hard to, to imagine the depth of commitment of this couple. They were bonded together in a commitment unto death, if that's what it took. The crimes uh, are never forgotten. The very end, these criminals can be uh, judged for the crimes they had committed. Mm -hmm. 